Hello, my name is Michael Brooks. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Sullivan County Legislature, and welcome to today's early autumn edition of Let's Talk Sullivan. With us, as usual, is our Chairman, Robert Doherty, and joining Robert and myself today is Lori Orslano James. I'm sure many folks in the county know of Lori and her fantastic work on our COVID-19 task force. First of all, welcome, Lori. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and always great to see you, Mike. Yes. Lori and myself go back. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while and uh, Lori always appreciated the work that Lori does and the time and effort and the passion in which she tackles issues and the task in front of her in COVID-19. The task force is no exception. So with that, Lori, uh, we have you here today to talk about the task force, booster shots versus third shots, and anything you'd like to share with regards to COVID-19 and Sullivan County. So um, first of all, let me just say thank you. You know, the, the legislative body made a very conscious decision uh, earlier on in the COVID fight in our county to ensure that there was a task force in place to assist and organize all entities trying to provide services re all regarding everything around and inclusive of vaccination, education, understanding of how to make contacts. We had numerous businesses call us up and say there was an exposure. What do I do? How do I go about this? And just seeking information in a, in a uh, more rapid fashion so that they could also be helpful in the protection of the citizens of Sullivan County. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had the honor of working with um, not only uh, the Sullivan County folks, but also working with people at Garnet Medical Center, Middletown Medical Center, uh, Rafua, you name it, plus businesses that were looking for information or helping to get vaccinations to their um, to their folks. There's really been um, this really terrific networking that has taken place in order to make sure we're getting as much factual information out as possible. As you know, facts need to be facts. This is not, COVID, COVID doesn't care whether you're Republican, Democrat, independent, conservative, it doesn't matter. What matters is it decides very clearly, I'm gonna go after this, person, mm -hmm. this human, and I'm going to get it. And if I don't get what I want, which is the ultimate desire of it, is death. If I don't get it from that, I'm going to mutate until I find a way to get it. So the key here is, is to listen to the medical science facts and then make decisions with your medical providers as to what is in the best interest for you. because just like with any vaccine, a vaccine is for your personal being. Mm -hmm. So it's a, we all get the flu shot. Spoke to someone this morning, never had a reaction from a flu shot, had a reaction. Lori, can you give me some information about what happens? Well, the same thing happens with a flu shot that happens with the, with the vaccines that are for COVID. It goes into your system, it builds antibodies. Your body triggers, wait, there's, a, there's this thing in my system to build those antibodies, and you may wind up with reactions from that. We do know that there have been, at a very small, small margin amount of side effects that have been severe. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, they're not. Um, I look at it this way. Um, I have a friend who recently just uh, was dealing with COVID and, um, and he outright said, he said, I'm so glad I got the shot because I would have been dead. Mm -hmm. my, my system would have not have uh, done what it needed to do, did all the treatments right, followed all the protocols, out on the streets today. He's out and about, I saw his vehicle just a little while ago. Um, so that that is what winds up being uh, the focus that we need to put in on. First of all, vaccines. No vaccines. Don't care what vaccine you're looking at. Those of us who are of my age and, you know, I always say I'm an old lady, old enough to remember, you know, those early shots of the mumps, rubella, all those sure. vaccines, all those things. Same, the same conversations took place, but they didn't take place with a political lens. It took place from the I have concern from a medical standpoint. Mm -hmm. And if everybody would just take a look from the medical standpoint and not listen to the medical standpoint of, as I lovingly call, Dr. Google, 
because people do a lot of doctor Googling, but actually go to your medical doctor that you deal with every day who knows your system and talk to them about the, uh, the, the protocol that should be used for you and what's in your best interest for your needs. If we all did that, we'd get better answers and we'd get truthful answers mm -hmm. um, based around medical science. That's step one. Step two, which I think is also very important in the understanding of, of the, the, vaccine, the, the vaccines themselves. Vaccines doesn't matter, and I was just saying earlier, the vaccines that we got when we were younger, doesn't mean I can't get that. Doesn't mean I can't get that disease. Mm -hmm. What stopped the disease from progressing? So if take, for example, polio. As you know, I'm a past president of Monticello Rotary. So one of our fights is to eradicate polio. And people go, what do you mean eradicate polio? Polio doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in our country. Right. But there are two countries currently in the Middle East that still have polio issues. The reason is not enough vaccination. Because in order for it not to yet again mutate and then infect others, you have to have enough people who have immunity set. So the vaccine may not prevent someone from getting COVID, but it will generally speaking, lessen their symptoms and possible death. And, you know, as you know, I'm a cancer survivor. And um, in that realm, I have fought for my life several times um, around that. And I'm not going to let COVID take me when I have these opportunities. Now, did I question getting the COVID vaccine? You bet I did. Did I question which one? You bet I did. Luckily, I have a team of nine doctors. And those nine doctors clearly said to me, yes, you need to get the vaccine, and here's why. And that was, again, my, my conversation with those medical doctors. There are people who think, oh, well, you know, Lori, from the political standpoint, that's why she believes in the vaccine. I believe in the vaccine because I got my facts. Mm -hmm. And I made sure that I knew what I needed to know based upon, you know, my, my form of cancer was caused by the HPV virus putting something else in my system could reactivate that HPV virus. I don't want to get cancer because, right. because it reactivated. I did all of my homework around it. I got my vaccine. I got my vaccine relatively early mm -hmm. um, because I did my questioning relatively early. Um, I got my second shot. Did I have side effects? I had side effects. I had a sore arm. I had a little bit of headache. That was it. Mm -hmm. My husband, older than I am, um, he had a sore arm. He was fatigued. So everyone has a little bit of a different scenario. Do some people have more severe? Yes, but that's good because it means you're building better antibodies. So because I didn't build, obviously, enough antibodies, I was just kind of like one of those light, lightweights, if you will, when it came to that, um, I became very interested when they started talking about the booster shot. And the booster shot is something that um, is obviously on, has been approved by, by FDA now for the Pfizer vaccine. Um, now, people who are healthy would, che would technically get a booster shot. Mm -hmm. But people like me who have immunosuppressed issues because of my health concerns from the past, I get what's called a third shot. It's different than a booster shot. Same vaccination, same amount of dosage, same everything. But what they know is, is that somebody like me did not build enough original antibodies up. So right now, currently in our county, based upon where we are at, uh, third shot Pfizer's are available um, and you can get them right here up in Liberty at our public health services and you can register but they will take a walk in but please understand you know each time you open one of those vials you have to have so many shots in you can't open a, a vial and then wait waste mm -hmm. the vaccination so it's rare it's, it's more important that we make that we make the calls make sure we register if we have that capability but nobody's going to be turned away we're going to make sure people are getting their their third their, their booster shot of Pfizer. So let me ask you a question. When it comes to antibodies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, one's immune system, that is our first defense against anything. Antibodies are, for lack of a better description, soldiers that work along with the immune system and effectively going after, in this case, COVID-19. And with the Pfizer Moderna, it's program, it's mRNA, to, to specifically go after right. COVID. So, it, is there in your, um, well, in your travels and what you've researched and, and uh, talking to doctors, uh, 
an antibody test, because first thing that comes to mind is how how successful were any one of us? I took I had the Pfizer vaccine and building those antibodies. And if we do need a booster shot or someone that had COVID, how many antibodies do they have? Because that research has been back and forth. I think the latest is it's 27 times. I don't know if that's accurate, but if you've had it, you're 27 times more resistant to COVID. So let me take uh, the second part of that first. So the first thing was, or, or, or with regard to that, is the the conversation around, I've, I've had COVID, so why do I need a vaccine? Mm-hmm. I have enough antibodies. You do have antibodies because your body fights and therefore builds up those antibodies. What we know, um, and when you come into any of the clinics in Sullivan County that are that are done, one of the questions, because there is a pre-questionnaire that's done, is have you had COVID? And if so, what is that time frame from when you were diagnosed with it since with you coming in? Mm-hmm. Um, we've had people who have come in and said, um, I just got over COVID. You know, and we, you can give the vaccine, but you will probably have a more um, profound uh, side effect from taking that shot that close because you already have those antibodies in your system. So remember what I said earlier that people who got worse symptoms from, or side effects I should say, from the vaccine, it's because they built up better antibodies. So if you already have antibodies and then you're adding antibodies into it, you're adding that vaccine in, you're going to have a more severe response. You wanna make sure that the antibodies that are within the system um, are not on overload because then you overload your immune system. So what we recommend is, or what the medical, because mm-hmm. I'm, no, I'm no scientist, I don't profess to be, I just do a lot of learning from the doctors mm-hmm. and giving the information that I learn. When people ask me questions and I don't know, I don't create any nonsense around it. I say, don't know the answer to that, I'm gonna put you in, in touch with the person who does and or I will find out the information and get back to you. So in this particular case, we recommend 90 days. And when I say we, I mean the medical science mm-hmm. realm at the 90 days, and at that 90 days, then you can get that vaccine because that's what we know is is about the length of that additional boost, if you will. Okay. So it's the 90 day cycle, um, and that's what we recommend there. With regard to looking at antibodies and seeing what your body has, there is no per, per se tighter test that I'm aware of. Um, however, they can check to see if you've had COVID. Um, there, there, is, there are ways in seeing whether or not it's been in the system because, again, you may have antibodies that pick up in the traces, mm-hmm. and then there is the assumption that you did. Is there a guarantee? No. They can't say, oh, you absolutely did if you're post COVID. Right. So you know that there's the, there's the time that you were contagious, there is the time that you were quarantined. And then on the other end, that's why you hear so much, there's a difference because people say, but if I'm quarantined, all I need to do is get the letter saying that I'm no longer quarantined. But if I've had it, it's the letter's not good enough, I have to get clearance from a doctor. That's because that testing has to be done and everything has to be done to ensure that there's, that the, that the COVID uh, ability to, uh, to produce that, that COVID out to people and and give it to others has already been low enough. Mind you, people who just come out of COVID still have a viral load. It's very minimal. It's very minimal as to what can necessarily move on. Uh, But they should also be taking precautions post being let go. You shouldn't just go like right back out and hey world, here I am. Um, You should be taking the precautions to protect your young ones. But the viral load at that point is so minute it's okay to let them mm-hmm. be able to resume normal life. Um, so, th- so that antibody um, testing is not necessarily, to my knowledge, available. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I would say talk to your local doctors and see what they can do to find it out. I know that I did ask for antibody uh, tests to be done prior to, um, and all they could do is they said, we don't do antibodies, we can see whether or not you've had it. Yeah, and, uh, and I have not had it. Uh, but it, I wanna make sure that people understand Masking is, is still priority because I mask for you, you mask for me. We do that collectively to, to ensure that the spread of the virus doesn't go worse because, again, we don't want to ever get to omega. So masking, key. Continuing all of the other mitigating sources, you know, taking a look at, you know, washing hands, hand sanitizing, all of those things, making sure that when we are not sure who we are around, that's six foot spacing. And lastly, again, I just want to reiterate, wherever it is is that someone chooses to go, um, please reach out to our public health 
services in Sullivan County. Um, they have a schedule. If, if it doesn't meet what you need, they have, they have information as to where else you can go. They can answer questions. And again, the COVID task force is here to help you as well. Um, so certainly you can reach out to us. It's at Sullivan COVID, Sullivan COVID task force at gmail.com. I just want to make sure I have that one, that one straight and um, make sure that we're, you know, that we're answering your questions and getting you to the right sources because that's what the priority is. And everyone just stay safe. Ask the questions. Stay safe. Thank you, Lori. That was, uh, was a lot of information, very good information. And uh, there again, I want to thank you for your role. And uh, it's what makes communities work, our county work. We have a lot of folks such as Laura that give a lot of time and effort uh, in helping our county. And that's what makes our county special. Thanks once again, Lori. Thanks, Mike. Always a pleasure. Okay. okay, moving on to our next subject. I'm going to throw this over to Rob and a couple updates on the Care Center. So, Rob, will you tell the folks of Sullivan County what's new with the Care Center? Sure. Thanks, Mike. i got to tell you, that was a very informative mm -hmm. session that you had with Lori. She is just fantastic. She Thank is. you again, Lori. So, on the Care Center, so, um, you know, we signed the contract on, on uh, the 20th of September with... Uh, the Infinite Care, who we you know heavily vetted, um, and one of the questions during the vetting process that I asked was, "Will you pick up all pluses and minuses going forward?" And they said yes. And so we were going back and forth with the Town of Liberty on assessing the taxes for the first time in nearly a you know a fifty years, mm -hmm. right? So they decided that they were going to tax it, which is their right to do. Um, we were then going to be hit with a two, you know, over a two hundred thousand dollar, you know, tax bill. Keep in mind the LDC is being hit with that bill. The county is not being hit with that bill. And so then we called up our partners and said, "Hey, this is part of the pluses and minuses." And they said, "We will pay that bill." And that's why you vet people, and that's why you pick good partners. You don't do the wink and nod nonsense. This is why you don't hire your friends. This is why you 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 vet everyone and you have it in an open forum. And that's what we did exactly. And that's uh, why we look forward to Infinite Care actually, you know, correct. fully kicking in the gear. Correct. And, and and again, I want to thank, you know, Legislative Perello and Legislative Steingarten for spending five, six weekends going to a lot of homes, uh, reporting back, you know, to the legislature. I thought they did a fabulous job on that. We went to a couple of homes ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, let's say Sorensen went to a couple of homes. Uh, you know, and and we really got out there. We and we talked. We talked amongst us. You know, ourselves in public, and you know, we were able to narrow it down. And this is why you do this stuff. And infant care. You know, the good news is we have a twenty-year contract with them, and we found that early on in in the contract that we pick good partners. And this is what you want to do in, in the county. So overall, it's a win. The school gets two hundred twenty-six thousand dollars on an annual basis. The county gets one hundred sixty thousand, and the town gets one hundred sixty thousand. So I think this is an absolute win for for the county. And this is what happens when you do your homework and you go through the process properly, and you take your time and you do it correctly. And find an operator that can and run that very important service. Uh, Obviously, from a company that we're very, I mean, this is just a, a great example of picking somebody that's going to partner with the county. And this is a business they do, they do well. And nothing but, nothing but uh, it's all good stuff. Looking forward to a uh, continued relationship with Infinite Care. All right, next up on our list is broadband, and uh, I'll just expound on that a little bit. There's not much new. This has been, uh, the broadband project is definitely a um, uh, exercise in patience. The funding we're uh, still waiting on, and uh, there's been some more optimistic um, communications with the, uh, the folks in charge of this federal program, that uh, I'm not even going to put dates on anymore because things keep getting pushed further. So uh, it's a little bit more optimistic than it has been. And but in preparation of I'll be, I'll be optimistic that we'll get the funding. Uh, we're doing a lot of the housekeeping, if you will, that needs to be done in order to to run uh, with this uh, when the money does 
does become available. There's a lot of moving pieces to this. It's a, uh, I can safely say a care center has been um, the biggest issue in the last couple of years for the county, but going forward, broadband is. This is a unbelievable initiative the county's uh, decided to um, take on. But the importance and scope of this is very large, and so there's a lot of housekeeping to be done uh, up front. That also takes time. So in the end, uh, you know, things are moving forward. Uh, I think we all would like to snap our fingers and have this happen really fast uh, and provide service for everyone, but that just is not realistic. And unfortunately, when you are waiting on uh, the approvals for grants, they do take time. Government, um, you know, we're we're fortunate for the programs, but um, there again, it takes patience. Okay, next up on our list is the energy tax repeal. We've talked about it before. Rob, uh, please elaborate on what transpired this past month. Okay, so what's happened is, uh, in the state's infinite wisdom, we asked them for the language that they wanted in the resolution to end the energy tax. And they gave us the language that they wanted. And they told us it was going to end by September 1st. They come back to us and say, no, 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 we're going to end it on December 1st. Oh, and by the way, that resolution that you passed that we gave you the language for, well, here's some more language, and we want you to change the language that you first did. This is what happens when you deal with the state folks. And it is trying, trust me when I tell you. As a private businessman, I would never do business the way the state does business. Trust me. And so we passed another resolution on 927, and it is absolutely gonna end on December 1st. And again, we apologize that, when, that we put it on. We had an end date, we had a sunset date, you know, on it for March 1st of 2023. We, we you know, it was an untrying time. We didn't know where we were going, and we were able to navigate through that successfully, and we ended it early. We ended it as soon as we can, and again, as a county, we apologized that we had to do it, but we had no idea what, what was going to happen during that pandemic. And I thank you for your patience, and I thank you for, for understanding the situation. Thank you, Rob. Hey, I'm here to help, Mike. Now that... Uh that is uh, there again, just a, an example. And just so folks, because um, I've had a few people in our community come up to me, um, obviously, as Rob explained, there's nothing, uh, there's no deals looking to extend this beyond the September 1st. This was all at the state and the wording. And we're just doing what uh, they want us to do in order for this um, energy tax to be repealed. It's just that simple. So moving on to the next uh, subject, Rob. Sure thing, Mike. Uh, budget prep. We t mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit about it our last meeting. Yes. And so what's new? So this is what's new. Josh is always working hard you know, on the budget. Uh, our county manager has won six awards in a row. Every year that he's been county manager, he has won an award for the budget process. Uh, this legislature is pe different than the past legislators. We do not want to bond for roads. We feel that that's a necessary service that the government, that the county should provide without, you know, adding extra debt to the taxpayers of Sullivan County. Remember, when you bond, you are borrowing money, and it costs money to borrow money. So when you see people bond, you know, three, three and a half million dollars, that's going to cost the county hundreds of thousands of dollars down the road. So we want to stop that and be able to use our tax dollars in a better form. Okay, so Mr. Conklin, who's head of uh, management and budget and does a fine job and, you know, has the chair of that committee, uh, will be putting out a schedule next week of when the budget hearings will be. Uh, this legislature held budget hearings last year and we're going to do it again this year. And I think that, you know, uh, Mr. Conklin, uh, Heading those those meetings uh, along with uh, the county manager Josh Potosik, uh, I think that you're going to be very happy with the budget, and it's going to cut down on one thing. I can guarantee you that we're going to cut down on bonding and not put the county into future debt. One thing, um, just maybe generally speaking, 
Uh, some folks out there may not know what that budget hearing process will be. We'll have George and we'll have our county manager, Josh, but will there be folks coming and speaking to us? Correct. So what happens in, in the process is department heads, you know, and you schedule different departments on different days. Generally speaking, there's about four public budget meetings. And you have, you know, the sheriff come and speak. You have DPW, which is, you know, the largest department in the county. You have the DA come and talk. You have other, you know, departments come and say, you know, talk about what their needs are for, for the upcoming year. And we have to balance, you know, wants with what we actually have. You know, and that's important because we're here for the taxpayer. We're not here to run departments. We're here to run the whole county. You know, and we have to take the, you know, a large view of it where they're looking at their department and everyone wants you know, new furniture, more people. You know, we understand that, but we also have financial restraints because our largest issue in this county, in my opinion, is taxation, and it's got to stop. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> okay, we have a couple items left that we want to go over today. It's, it's basically hemp and heap. So we'll we'll start with industrial hemp. Okay, so Rob, uh, talk a little bit about industrial hemp and the differences with cannabis, so on and so forth. Okay, so industrial hemp, I think, is an economic engine that this county absolutely needs. Um, it has to be looked at. Uh, first, we need to understand the difference. This cannabis. And I know there's a lot of talk right now about different towns allowing it to be sold and other towns not allowing it to be sold in that particular town, which makes zero sense to me either way Either way, you fall on it because they can buy it in another town and bring it to your town and smoke it. It's, it's the law. Okay? So if the town wants to opt out of it, that's their option, and that's fine. So with industrial hemp, what you have to understand is, you know, on the western side of the county, we have acres upon acres upon acres of land that's currently underdeveloped. A lot of it was farmland, and I think it should stay farmland. I think you know putting the housing projects there is 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 not what our county is built for. I think that we need to you know focus on agriculture. You know, as a county, you know we're a tourism, agriculture, healthcare county, and those are the three things that you know we're good at and we need to get better at and industrial hemp does just that um, industrial hemp is can be used for many products um, I know there's clothes being made with it there's you know paper being made with it but mostly you can use it for building products and that's where I think that it can be applied very effectively very quickly and I think that you know there's farmers you know who have different crops, it regenerates the, 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 the land, um, it, it can be used as an alternate crop when you, you grow you know, potatoes or beans or something along those lines, and then you know, the next year you grow hemp, and on the other part you, know, you grow the, 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 the potatoes, the beans, and you know, corn, and stuff like that. And I think that, that on the western side of the county, it could be revolutionary. I think it's worth the look at it. The best thing about it is it's a renewable resource. And I think that we need to start looking in that direction more in this county, you know, as, as, as we proceed further. Okay, lastly today, uh, HEAP season. Uh, it is upon us. It's here. Uh, HEAP stands for, uh, government's great for acronyms, HEAP stands for Home Energy Assistance Program. Uh, this is not money that goes right directly to individuals. This is money that goes to the uh, energy providers, depending on what source of heat that you use. Uh, we have a great staff that is there, uh, willing to answer any questions, enroll you if it's necessary. The HEAT program has helped numerous families through the cold season. So even if you are unsure if you qualify for the service, please call and the number will be listed on the screen uh, and to inquire. I'd like to close the following comments. Take a moment and just go over the list that we've discussed today, the list of items we had to discuss today. We started with COVID with Lori James. We talked about the care center, about broadband, the repeal of the energy tax, our budget preparation, industrial hemp, and HEAP. So I just want everyone just to think about just the subjects we talked about today and what this county 
and what the legislature and the county manager's office and all of the folks that work for the county are doing for the county and the leadership that's provided. We listened to you when we all ran. We told you from the foundation from which we would make decisions. We, we try every week, every month to live up to that. And I think today's examples of what we discussed just illustrates what we ran on and what we're trying to do for the residents of the county. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for, for uh, joining us and listening to uh, the subjects that we covered today. And until next time, bye for now.